Hey you guys, here we are in our second installment of chapter 24, the next two sections. There's only four sections this chapter, but there's a lot of information in here that they put in this four sections. So let's get started. Aromatic hydrocarbons. This is another functional group type of thing for organic chemistry. And an aromatic hydro hydrocarbon contains uh, this benzene ring. That's the definition of an aromatic hydrocarbon, one that contains a benzene ring. This hydrocarbon or benzene can have two different resonance structures. Those resonance structures are seen if you flip these bonds around, you will generate the other resonance structure right over here. Neither one of these are actually real or true. That's why sometimes you'll see a circle in the middle. These are caused because of these sp2 hybridized carbons. Every carbon is sp2 hybridized, and that gives you that trigonal planar structure around every carbon atom. But then there's also a delocalized electron in an unhybridized p orbital on every single one of these carbon atoms. That gives that delocalization around here, which then ends up making that a perfect hexagon. And there's your one with that circle in it, and that's how you see benzene represented in organic chemistry. So to name these things, you name them by that benzene being the parent. These are very simple uh, structures. So ethylbenzene, chlorobenzene, uh, aminobenzene, and uh, nitrobenzene. These are uh, indicated by, by their uh, numbering around the ring. The numbering around the ring is not needed if there's only one functional group. But if there's more than one functional group, you have to say where it is. 1,2-dibromobenzene, for example, means they're right next to each other. This, of course, would be 1,3-dibromobenzene. You might see out there in the literature, this is called ortho. Ortho means they're right next to each other, and meta means they're in the 1,3 position. Of course, these only occur, these, these types of names are only for di-substituted benzene, such as these. So for the reactions that these type, that aromatic uh, compounds undergo, is the main one is substitution. Now in your fun sheet, I'm asking you to identify the different types of reactions, uh, substitution, addition, elimination, and oxidation. We've also, we've already covered um, addition when we were talking about uh, double bonds. Now in aromatic compounds, substitution is the most common. Substitution uh, means that something gets substituted for another thing. So hydrogen in an aromatic ring is substituted by a bromine atom. So since the double bonds here are not real, you don't get an addition reaction because of the delocalization of the electrons. There's not really a double. There's a delocalized sp2 hybrid system. So anyway, this is a substitution reaction where a hydrogen is substituted for by a bromine. Another example of substitution is where an alkyl group, here's an alkyl group, alkyl halide, we call these things Rx, and they need special catalysts. And this catalyst is an aluminum chloride catalyst. And when this catalyst is involved, there's a mechanism that this undergoes um, and goes through, but we're not gonna worry about that. We're just gonna worry about the fact that it's a benzene ring plus Rx. And the benzene ring now has that R group attached to it. So if I draw my benzene ring, that R group is attached to it, plus the uh, hydrogen halide that's kicked off, so I could call this HX. So this is a very general way of looking at something, and organic chemistry uses these templates all the time. So if you see a, uh, something that fits this template, that it's a benzene ring plus an alkyl halide, you will get that alkyl group put on the benzene ring, not a halide. If you have these reaction conditions, you will have the halogen put on the benzene ring because that's really all there is. There's just halogens and halogens everywhere. So you might think that, could I do with this, this with chlorine? Yes, and you see chlorine being uh, used as a reactant, but now the catalyst is FeCl3, and you get a chlorine put on the benzene ring. Some polyaromatic hydrocarbons that are interesting to look at are things like naphthalene, uh, anthracene, all of these things are PAHs, they're called. And PAHs are known to be very carcinogenic. And if you ever heard people say, oh, there's PAHs in cigarette smoke. It is true. There is a, a PAHs in cigarette smoke, any type of smoke, it's a combustion reaction. And interestingly enough, when things combust, they make these crazy polyaromatic hydrocarbons. 
and this is found in soot. Um, and soot was a very common substance, of course, that chimney sweeps used to sweep out, and these poor people would die of horrible carcinomas because of, of the soot that they were constantly exposed to on their skin and in their lungs. Let's talk about some functional groups. Functional groups are groups on, on organic compounds that have certain functionalities. But just like you go to the zoo and you recognize a zebra and a giraffe and an elephant, you're going to look at a chemical formula or a structural formula such as this guy, and you're going to say, oh, that has an OH group, that is an alcohol. So the goal is to look at this. This is not out of your textbook. The textbook one I don't really like too much, so I put in this one. This one uh, shows you each of the individual functional groups, such as alcohols. Alcohol is an OH group stuck on an R group. R group has to have a carbon in it. An aldehyde is a carbon-containing compound. That would be a, an attachment to a carbon atom and a double-bonded oxygen with a hydrogen hanging off over here. An amid or amide is another carbon-containing thing here. And the, and the way this guy is attached is a C double bond O attached to a nitrogen, which is attached to a hydrogen or an R group. This can be another carbon containing thing and so can this. And it's still under an amide functional group category. And amine, same type of idea, carbon containing thing. This nitrogen here, these can also be R groups. So I can have an amine that is something like um, where you would have maybe a CH3 here and then you can have a nitrogen, but that nitrogen doesn't have to be hydrogens. It can be a CH3 group on there and a hydrogen. So either way, that's still an amine. A carboxylic acid group is an R group. Again, a carbon thing here. And this arrangement of two oxygens, a carbon and a hydrogen, is a carboxylic acid. The most common one that you know is acetic acid, and this is his Com, his real name is IUPAC or systematic name. F means two. Oic acid means carboxylic acid. And that's what you're seeing right here. It's a two carbon and it has the carboxylic acid functional group. So an ester group has a carbon containing thing here. And then we have the ester functionality. This R prime over here can be, as long as it's a carbon something, it can be CH3, CH2, CH3, it can be many different things. To name these things, you'll see that the, the name of the R prime comes first. This is the methyl right here. And then F means two carbons, one, two, O8 means ester. So of course you have some common names for that, but if you use the systematic name, you can never go wrong. So you have methyl ethano 8 is the name of that structure. Next on our list here is ether, and ether is a carbon-containing thing, both sides of this with an oxygen right in the middle. To name these, the systematic name is you name one of the sides and then the other. So the one of the side here, this methoxy, is OCH3. Methane is the parent. The next on our group here is a halides. A halide is a carbon containing thing attached to either a chlorine, fluorine, bromine, or iodine. So that's an alkyl. You'll hear it called an alkyl halide. Alkyl meaning uh, any type of carbon containing thing. And then halide meaning fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Our next on our list is ketone. A ketone has two carbon containing things with this C double bond O in the middle. The simplest ketone we can have is acetone. And acetone is, takes this structure right here. Its systematic name is propanone, prop meaning three. So you have one, two, three carbons. There's your prop. Own is the ending for ketone. And so prop is a, propanone is a three carbon ketone. It's the simplest ketone you can have because you must have R groups on both sides of a carbon. So you must have a minimum of three. Next on our list is an alkene, and we've already talked about alkenes and their structures and their reactions, but an alkene has a carbon-carbon double bond, and it can have um, R groups on all of these spots or none of them. The simplest alkene would be ethylene or ethene. Ethylene is a common name for that, but if you just put all these H's on here, 
this is F E. So there you go for that. Okay, now this guy is an alkyne, our next one. Alkyne is a triple bonded carbon atom. And then with either carbons on both sides like this or hydrogens. If it were hydrogens, the simplest alkyne is acetylene or ethyne. We talked to that about a little bit about that when we went over this alkene, alkyne structures. So this was acetylene or ethyne. And they're giving you an example of methyl acetylene or propyne. Propyne is the systematic name for three, one, two, three, prop, and then ine means that's the ending for a um, alkyne. So go back to this. This uh, table is included in your guided reading that I always include for these chapters. So if you want to uh, reference it again, um, it's in that file. So let's have some functional group fun. Now I've changed things a little bit because you know when I review these things, I come up with some neat ideas. I know you guys are like, no, no more neat ideas. But you know, that's what I just did. So let's just talk about how uh, we could play around with the molecule and as far as a molecular formula is concerned and say what's, how many different structures can we draw for a given molecular formula. So in this example, here's our molecular formula, C3H6O. Now you might think, oh wow, only three carbons. How many different structures can I give for that? Well, apparently there are 34. Now you wouldn't think that's the case, but what I've introduced you guys to is called Molgen. And I found it just this morning because I was thinking, how many structures are there for C3H6O? And I thought, oh, there's probably five, six, maybe 10. Nope, there are 34. So I found that using this Molgen. It's a really cool, nifty little program. I'm gonna show you a screenshot of it on the next slide that you get to put in your formula and it will generate all the different structures for you. Now, you gotta be careful with these little structure generators because sometimes they generate things that are never gonna happen, but that doesn't mean they're not following a set of rules. And those rules are the octet rule, especially mainly for these, uh, inner, these organic compounds. So here's just five of the few that can be generated using that mole gen. And if you look in, you've looked at this structure, you may say, oh, here's a carboxylic acid. Oh, here's an ester. Oh, here is, I don't know what this guy is. This is, has a special name in organic chemistry, but we're not gonna play with that here. But either way, it's a, it's a cyclic structure and those oxygens are taking parts of the cyclic structure. Again, this kind of looks like the same thing, but it's not because it's rearranged just slightly different. You'll notice the oxygens are together here, whereas over here they were separated by one carbon atom. And then over here, again, we got even a smaller ring with two OH groups off of it. You might say, oh, that looks like an alcohol. And it is. It has two OH groups, which is called a diol. Of course, di meaning two, all meaning alcohol. So you can, you can quickly see that what I call the chemical zoo is getting very, very populated with different types of structures, different names, but either way, it's just fun. It's all a puzzle of how to figure out what all these things are doing. So for your new murder sheet question, since I'm using discussion boards uh, to engage you guys in discussions about the things that you're working, I thought we would try a different one. And I wanted you to go uh, to uh, Molgen and type in this formula, C3H6O2, and see what you can see. What type of isomers are they? How many do you get? And check it out, I'm gonna, we're gonna go to the next slide and I'm gonna show you what Molgen looks like. Molgen looks like this, where you type in your formula and it says, well, I'll be there are 34 available. Wow. So they give you with this little JS Mole, it's a cute, neat little program that they've been using for probably the past 30 years on generating formulas and then you can rotate these. And then what I want you guys to do is when you look at a, um, a structure in here, <coughs> to go ahead and hit 3D placement. And this 3D placement changes the structure to its correct molecular geometry. So in order to use this, just put in your formula, hit start mole gen, it will generate all the possible structures. And then on next and previous, you can scroll through them, the different structures. And then when you're on the structure that you wanna look at, click 3D placement. 
and it will do some funny things and then all of a sudden you'll get a different looking structure and you can rotate this and see its true molecular geometry or ideal molecular geometry. So try that for that and post your answers to the discussion board. I've assigned everybody a different structure. For this one, I thought we could do things like structures 1 and 34, and then you could do a little snip. Uh, there's a snipping tool on every um, PC, and that snipping tool enables you to take a snip and that's how I took a snip of this right here when I was playing with it this morning and just hit copy and then paste into your discussion board. So see you in the discussion board on that one. Hopefully you'll have some fun with that. So let's keep on talking about functional groups. Let's talk about alcohols. Alcohols are structures that have this OH on them. That's an alcohol. This has a special name, phenol, because that is a benzene ring. And benzene rings, when they are listed as a, like a substituent, which is hanging off of a group of a big organic molecule, they'll be called uh, phenyl or phenol. It depends, actually, it depends on who you're talking to or like what part of their country they're from. I always call it phenyl. That's a phenyl group. So, but when it's in this specific arrangement, this is a phenol, O-L, meaning alcohol. So when we look at our alcohols to name them, uh, you have the O-L on the end, which means alcohol. Meth means one carbon. Let's go to the next one. Eth means two carbon. O-L means alcohol. Let's go to the next one. O-L means alcohol. But this is a propanol. Prop means three. Two says where the alcohol is. Because you might think that I could probably put the alcohol functional group on carbon number one. And if I did that, that would be N-propanol or one propanol. So either way, you can see how it can get pretty messy pretty quickly, but it's just understanding the pattern. This guy's common name is ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol, a glycol, is a common name for uh, compounds that have more than one OH group on their carbon backbone. So this guy can also be called 1,2-eth. Di diol. You know, I don't know. I'm going to have to look that guy up. But either way, I, I, I'm blanking on his, his, uh, his IUPAC name because I'm so used to this, this common name of ethylene glycol. I think it's eth, try to write it out here, eth, and then you go like this, ane, but you don't continue. You say one, two, I know it seems so cumbersome, but, you know, this is the way it's named, diol. Okay, so let's keep on talking about alcohols. How do we produce alcohols? Well, the production of ethanol, which everybody likes to drink, or some people do, is you can do it by biological production. Of course, by enzymes, yeast will make ethanol and carbon dioxide, and that's how beer is made and wines and so on. Or you can commercially produce it from Petroleum feedstocks, which means it comes from carbon containing or carbon compounds coming from petroleum. And you, it's called a hydrogenation reaction, or no, I'm sorry, this is a hydrolysis reaction. And it's acid catalyzed. Here's your acid. And what is happening is that this is an addition reaction. If you remember, an addition reaction is adding something across a double bond. So one of them go here, and then the other part goes here. And that is uh, making an alcohol through commercially produced ethene. Remember, this is an, a double bond, so this would be called ethene. Or you, you also see it called ethylene is a common name. So metabolic oxidation. Well, what happens when we drink alcohol? If you remember from Chapter 13, alcohol dehydrogenase comes in and makes it into a different compound. If you draw this out, uh, and to show how things are attached. This also shows how it's attached, but if I draw it out structurally, you'll see that this is called an aldehyde, and this is makes acet aldehyde. If you remember, that was that toxic compound that makes you feel sick from drinking alcohol, and then your body continues on with another um, aldehyde dehydrogenase and creates acetic acid. Let's go on to our next functional group, ethers. Ethers look like this, R, O, R, those being carbon-containing compounds. Ether used to be used as, a, as an anesthetic for surgery. It is not anymore. But either way, to create ethers, 
uh, we can do a condensation reaction. And a condensation reaction is where you condense out water and it kind of puts them together and squeezes out water. That's a condensation reaction, looks and it creates an ether. For aldehydes and ketones, uh, aldehydes and ketones contain this called carbonyl functional group. That carbonyl functional group has a lot of chemistry associated with it because oxygen is partial negative. And this carbon then becomes partial positive. And that means it attracts things that are negative. So it can actually attract, kick something out, and then change the structure. So that's why there's so much chemistry involved with carbonyl functional groups. Aldehydes have the general structure, of, like we saw in the previous slide, that H, this must H must be here for it to be an aldehyde. Ketones have two carbon containing groups to be a ketone. So this is our simplest aldehyde. This is called methanal or formaldehyde. Form is a common name for one carbon. So when you see formic acid or formaldehyde, that means there's only one carbon. This is also an aldehyde. This is would be called ethanol or acetaldehyde for its common name. And then this is our simplest ketone acetone, like we saw on our previous slide of functional groups. Let's go on to carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids are very common. They're everywhere in nature. Uh, here's that formic acid that I was just talking about. That's one carbon atom. There's that form. This is also would be called methanoic acid because meth stands for one carbon. So methanoic acid. So all of these that you see on this slide are carboxylic acids. So if you look through carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid, benzoic acid is a common name for this guy. Glycine is an amino acid and he has a carboxylic acid because amino acids have an amino group and a carboxylic acid group and that's why they're called amino acids. Oxalic acid is a, is a pesky little compound that you find in, in spinach. And if you eat too much of this, you can get oxalates or oxalate kidney stones. Citric acid, of course, is in oranges and it has three acidic functional groups. No wonder it burns if you have a cut because it's very acidic. Let's keep on going. We have esters and ester looks something like this type of functional group. So when we draw it out, we have an R group and then we have a C double bond O. And then we have another O and another R group. And this R group over here can be the same or different as this R group. It doesn't have to be different. It can be the same. So these esters, what's nice, I always think about this when I cut an apple, because the apples have um, esters in them that give them that apple flavor. When you buy something, a piece of candy that is flavored with banana or cherry or all of these things are ester esters that have different arrangements on them that give them the different flavors. So that's why they're showing a picture here of a soda, because if you buy cherry soda or something like that, or, or orange or whatever, it has esters in it that have been identified to have that flavor. Chemists take all the fun out of everything. Instead of just eating an orange, we just get the structure and then we'll just put it in the water. So this guy's name is ethyl acetate. Eight is the um, ending for an ester, but if you remember, this, to name these um, from that slide when we were looking at functional groups, you name this portion first. This is an ethyl group, so I'm going to call him ethyl. And that is always listed first in an ester. And then you look at the other portion, and the other portion also has two carbons. So two carbons is eth again, eth and, but now it becomes O, but there's that eight on the end. Ethanoate, ethyl ethanoate. That's the name of that structure. Ethyl acetate is the common name because acetate, acetic acid, that's this piece right here. And that's that common name. Let's talk about amines. Amines are organic bases and they have a certain general formula of R3N that R, those R's can be hydrogens or they can be a mixture of hydrogens and carbon containing compounds. Now something looks funny here because here I have a CH3, but here I have an R. But just think of it as RNH2 and then plus water. This is a type of reaction that an amine undergoes. And that amine, uh, if we think of this as being water and think of water in organic chemistry, you think of water as being in two pieces when it is an, a reactant. And the reaction that this would undergo, remember he has a lone pair right here 
this lone pair is going to go pick up this hydrogen and then this whole piece or hydroxide is going to leave and you see him over here. So this would make, uh, in this specific case here, you would it would make amino, methyl amino salt, ammonium salt, methyl ammonium salt. So here it would be CH3 NH3 plus. And now if you guys remember, but in our acid base chapter, we looked at this one and this one and said, hey, that is a, uh, could be a buffer because that would be a weak base and it's conjugate. And there's another example of, of the type of reactions that these undergo. These undergo acid base reactions. So again, if this is a base, this is gonna go out and pick up the acid off of the acid, hydrochloric acid, and kick it off. And this is a salt. Because remember, a salt just means it has a positive and a negative portion. So since this is a salt, this would be called ethyl amino ammonium chloride. Ethyl, see them right here? Ethyl ammonium chloride. <clears throat> so just as a quick overview here, this table is out of your textbook and I just wanted to go over it because if this is the only one that you see, um, then you might think it's a little different than the other one, which it is, but it still shows the different functional groups and talks about the typical reactions that they undergo. So an alkene, here's your functional group of an alkene, the double bond, it undergoes addition with halogens, hydrogen halides, and water hydrogenation with, uh, to yield uh, alkanes. So we went over those different types of reactions when we were looking at that section. So just to take a peek at all these, it's giving you the same information uh, that I gave you in the previous slide, except in this slide, it gives you the typical reactions, which is kind of helpful on your murder sheet. So let's talk about the murder sheet question number three. For each reaction, I was uh, gave you a reaction, and then I wanted you to look at the name and convert it into a chemical uh, chemical structure. Identify the functional groups present. Find the section in your textbook that describes that functional group and the reaction that it undergoes. And then you can look at the examples that they give, or even find uh, that specific reaction, a specific example, and then draw out the structure of the product and name the product. And then finally, indicate the type of reaction represented. Remember, that's a substitution reaction. A substitution reaction is a reaction in which part of the reactant is substituted for something else. We saw that with benzene, remember. Here was our little benzene molecule, the circle in the middle. And let's say this was a hydrogen off of here. We saw a reaction where we added bromine to it. And that bromine then, one of the bromines anyway, substituted the hydrogen for one of itself and, and kicked off. That was now bromine here. And now we have HBr as a side product. A lot of times you won't see the side product mentioned, but I always put it in there because it's nice to see where things went. Otherwise it looks confusing. When we balance organic chemical reactions, a lot of times we're like, oh, we don't care about that side product. But it's nice to put it in there because you know it's balanced then. Elimination is where a, 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 something of the reactant is eliminated out. So if you start with an alcohol, see I'm going to use words because I don't want to draw it out, but alcohol, if I eliminate out water, I get an alkene. So if you ever take organic chemistry, it's nice to be able to just know the patterns. And I squeeze out water, water was eliminated. That's also called a condensation reaction. An addition reaction, of course, is where something is added, and we saw that adding something to an alkene. Like, I could reverse this right here. If I reverse this, that's an addition, and this is an elimination. In organic chemistry, you call here elimination called E reactions, and additions called S's for substitution. Well, I guess that's for substitution, sorry. So for addition, it's not necessarily, it doesn't really have a letter. For oxidation, oxidation is a little bit different then it is an inorganic chemistry and in oxidation reactions. Inorganic chemistry is where the reactant has the number of bonds to oxygen increased or the number of bonds to hydrogen decreased. So as an example of this, if you take an aldehyde, there's an R group, and remember an aldehyde looks like this. If I oxidize it, and in organic chemistry, we've got lots of different oxidizing agents, and oxidizing agents can be things like sodium dichromate or the, uh, the chromates uh, are good oxidizing agents. And that means they somehow 
add oxygen to the, the reactant and the mechanisms are somewhat complex. But if I were to oxidize a carbo a, 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 an aldehyde, I get a carboxylic acid. Now, if you recall, in our oxidation of ethanol in the body, um, your body takes ethanol and it oxidizes it to an aldehyde. So if I just go ahead and put an al alcohol here, your body uses enzymes to do this, but in organic chemistry, we use inorganic oxidizing agents most of the time. And then we can increase our number of bonds to oxygen. Here, there was one bond to oxygen. Now here, there's two bonds to oxygen. And now here, there's three bonds to oxygen. So that is an oxidation reaction. You can continue on and go all the way to carbon dioxide, which has four bonds to oxygen. So in this one sheet, emergency sheet question, you want to look at the reaction and do all of these things to it. So here's some examples. These are from the murder sheet. Your goal is to go find where benzene is talked about and the reactions and then see what happens. Here's an alcohol. That is an oxidizing agent. There's that chromate that I was talking about. I'm trying to give you hints here just for fun. Smells like vinegar. Well, maybe acetic acid is produced in that reaction. Smells like an ether. Maybe an ether is produced in that reaction and so on. For this one, I had to feel soapy. And that's because soaps have certain functional groups and that make them act as soaps. So in this reaction, you might be producing a soap type molecule. And then for this final one, methylamine, this is an amine. What, what are the reactions of amines with acids? And then look salty. We talked about what a salt was earlier, a plus and a minus. So there's probably a plus and a minus in this product. So finally, for murder sheet question number five, the goal here was to just have some functional group fun again and be able to look at these large molecules and say, oh, that has a certain type of functional group in it. So in these problems, your goal is to locate by circling the and give the name of each functional group. So I might look at this and go, oh, I think that this is an alcohol. And if you recall, these little vertices here mean that it's a carbon atom. And remember from chemistry one that these little wedges means it's coming out of the board. And if you have things that are dashes, that means it's going into the board. So it gives it three dimensionality, which we need when we talk about stereoisomers or chiral centers. I'm asking you to mark chiral centers, at least one of them with an asterisk. Remember chiral centers have four different groups around that carbon atom. So you could look at a carbon atom and count the groups. So if I do the one that I was looking at here, remember there is a hydrogen on here. So this carbon has four different groups and would be a chiral center. There are many in this molecule. So again, the goal for here is to locate and circle. And I have here circle the ether functional groups in red. So since you're home and you're gonna turn in this fun sheet, it would be nice to go find yourself some a red pen or a red, get your crayons out and circle, because when I grade it, I'm gonna be looking for that. I'm gonna look and see if you circled the correct ones, either ones in red, the alcohols in blue, and the halides in black. So when I ask you then to count the, the number and type of atoms in this to get the molecular formula, don't forget to add on hydrogens, the octet rule applies here, where there is nothing listed, and it looks like there's only three things, there's really four, there's a hydrogen on there. So add all the hydrogens in and then count up all your carbons, all your hydrogens, all your oxygens, Ooh, nitrogens first, and then your oxygens and then your halogens. And why this is important is because in, or in organic chemistry, this is the very traditional way of listing the, the number and type of elements in the compound. If you do it in a different fashion and you try to Google the formula, you get a different answer. I know it's really strange, but I've had people have trouble finding what this is by formula if they just switch these around up here. So keep it in this order. If you're still having trouble, fine, switch them around. But the goal is to find um, the description that we're looking for. And recall the drink that Judy was drinking, that, dr that she drank was sweet and it had certain types of compounds in it. So some of these are going to be sweeteners. Some of these are going to be drugs that a dog, that her dog member came back from a surgery might have been prescribed to take home with, with him after a surgery. 
Of course, this is based on a true story. Yes, I did have a dog that his leg was removed for bone cancer. And I had a dog, Alasa Opso, who was diagnosed with canine cognitive disorder. Well, very generally. Um, so anyway, those give you hints of what you're looking for when you're Googling these formulas. So have fun with that. And I look forward to the discussion post and to see what you guys uh, come up with. And don't forget your source of information and the name of the compound.